Good evening, everyone. I'm Mary Pat Higgins, President and CEO of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight for our Meet the Author event with New York Times bestselling author, Pam Jenoff. I'd like to start tonight by thanking our generous sponsor of this event, Northern Trust. We are so grateful for your dedicated support of the museum, especially during these unprecedented and trying times. You're a true partner and we are really grateful. Our mission of teaching the history of the Holocaust and advancing human rights to combat prejudice, hatred and indifference has unfortunately never been more important than it is today. Your support enables us to make positive change in our community through education. Without you, we simply could not continue to offer inspiring virtual programs like tonight's with best-selling author, Pam Jenoff. I read The Diplomat's Wife over the holidays and couldn't put it down. And I can't wait to hear from Pam in a moment to learn more about her and her, inspire, her inspiration for writing so many incredible novels. I'd also like to give a warm welcome to our museum members. We are so grateful for your ongoing support. If you're not currently a member, please consider becoming one. If you join tonight, you can enjoy a membership for only half the price. Please see the link in the comments section of our uh, Zoom link to redeem this special. And we will also include the link in our post event mail to you as, as well. And as always, I'm so grateful for the support of our wonderful board of directors. I know several of you are with us tonight, including a few of our newest board members. Welcome. As many of you know, last year, the museum temporarily closed for five months due to COVID-19. And although we reopened to the public on August 14th, school groups are not able to visit in person this year. In response, the museum's education team created numerous virtual resources and programs to continue educating students and adults alike across North Texas and beyond. This includes TEKS aligned lessons, interactive outreach programs and resources, virtual camps, a virtual special exhibition tour, and public lectures and programs like tonight's. We have hosted over 100 free community programs last year that reached more than 27,000 participants. The museum also created interactive virtual student field trips. We lead multiple live video virtual student field trips each day. In fact, we had a record breaking attendance last week with more than 1000 participants in just one day. These programs and resources allow educators to teach students the museum's critical lessons while they are unable to visit in person. If you're an educator yourself or interested in learning more, please visit our website at dhhrm.org. Before we begin our program, please know that we will have time for questions at the end of the program. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to type out and submit your questions and we'll get to as many of them as possible. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator this evening, Cecily Bolding. Cecily is a wealth strategist for Northern Trust in North Texas, where her focus is working with individuals, families, and institutions to develop advanced solutions for the complexities they face in their financial lives. In addition to her role at Northern Trust, she also dedicates her time and energy to advance our mission by serving as a member of our board of directors. Cecily, we are so fortunate to have you on our board and to have you leading our conversation tonight. Thank you, Mary Pat. It's so good to see you and I'm so happy to be here. Northern Trust believes that there is a return on the investment in developing upstanders. Equipping members of our North Texas community and beyond as we're seeing this evening with the tools to bring the attribute of an upstander to life is a worthy mission. An upstander does what is right, even when it's not easy and even when they're alone which is why we're grateful to the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum for their leadership in fulfilling this mission. As Mary Pat referenced the format for this evening, I'll begin with an interview of our guest of honor, Pam Jenoff, and then we will invite each of you to ask questions of her as well. 
let's begin with a little bit more about Pam. She is the author of several books of historical fiction, including the New York Times bestsellers, The Lost Girls of Paris and The Orphan's Tale, as well as her recent reissued novel that we will be discussing this evening, The Diplomat's Wife. Upon receiving her master's in history from Cambridge, she accepted an appointment as special assistant to the secretary of the army. The position provided a unique opportunity to witness and participate in operations at the most senior levels of government, including helping the families of the Pan Am Flight 103 victims secure their memorial at Arlington National Cemetery, observing recovery efforts at the site of the Oklahoma City bombing, and attending ceremonies to commemorate the 50th anniversary of World War II at sites such as Bastogne and Corregidor. Following her work at the Pentagon, Pam moved to the State Department, and in 1996, she was assigned to the U.S. Consulate in Krakow, Poland. It was during this period that Pam developed her expertise in Polish-Jewish relations and the Holocaust, working on matters such as preservation of Auschwitz and the restitution of Jewish property in Poland. Pam left the Foreign Service in 1998 to attend law school and graduated from the University of Pennsylvania. She worked for several years as a labor and employment attorney and now teaches law school at Rutgers. She and her husband also have three children. Pam, your work has been marked with achievement, service and creativity, quite a combination. Welcome. Thank you so much. Hello, nice to see you, Cecily. Nice to see you, Pam. Tell us how you made the shift from working at the Pentagon to becoming a best-selling author. I will do that. But before I do, I just wanted to say thank you so much um, to you, of course, for moderating and for all that you do and to Mary Pat and her team for the important work at the museum. Um, I would like to thank Melanie Kaur who introduced us as well as my good friend, Andrea Katz for bringing us together. And I would like to thank, I see people from not just the Dallas area and the Dallas area is so important to my books. It always has been, um, but good friends from across the country who have joined us from near and far. And so thank you all for having me. Um, so getting to your question, um, the story of how this all came to happen began about almost 25 years ago when I was sent to Poland as a junior diplomat for the State Department. And I unexpectedly found myself in that part of the world right as it emerged from communism. And so many important questions about the Holocaust had never been resolved during those years of oppression. Um, questions of anti-Semitism and property restitution and preserving the camps all came to the forefront as Poland struggled to become a democratic nation and join institutions such as NATO and, um, and join the rest of the community. And when I went to Poland, I was a young girl alone over there, um, no cell phones, no internet, no family. And so I gravitated toward that Jewish community in Poland, the survivors, um, as kind of my people, you know, I'm Jewish. And they became like family to me. And I spent two and a half years over there, immersed personally and professionally in very difficult questions and, and rewarding work, but difficult work about the Holocaust. When I left Poland, I did not continue on in diplomatic service. I came back to the United States and I went to law school, but I was so moved and changed by my years in that part of the world. And I knew I was going to write a book about those experiences and not just any book. I knew I would write a novel because I was one of those little kids who always wanted to be an, a writer never short stories and never poems, always novels. But all through my many years of school and living abroad, I had plenty of time to write and I never got started. And you all know what I mean. If I could see all of your faces right now, you would all be nodding because everyone has that one project they wanna get off the ground and somehow can't. So for me, the turning point was actually 9-11. I graduated from law school and I started working at a large firm in Philadelphia on September 4th, 2001. And one week later, when those horrific events unfolded, I had a life epiphany. Um, I realized that while being a lawyer was a fine and admirable profession, I had always wanted to be a writer. Um, and if I'd been a 9-11 victim, I never would have had that chance. I did not have forever 
and I had to get started. So I took a course um, at a local university night school and that course was called Write Your Novel This Year. And kind of away, way, away I went from there. Well, you didn't just write a novel, you've written several novels. So tell us a little bit about your process. Where do you draw inspiration? What goes into your research? Well, many questions there, and I apologize because my answers tend to be long. Um, you know, when I am looking for an idea for a book, I'm looking for that gasp. I'm looking for that aha moment. Because if I can find a true bit of history that after two decades of working on the Holocaust, make, make an idea that makes me gasp, makes me go, oh, I'm sort of hopeful that I'm onto something that the readers will feel the same way about. So that is always sort of the starting point for me with any book. I find a nugget of history that I think is interesting and I start digging and see if it takes me to sort of a bigger concept. Um, so I, I need to share, and I think we're talking about The Diplomat's Wife tonight, and specifically with respect to that book, I need to step back before it and I need to tell you about how my first book was inspired. Um, I was working um, I, I was working back here in the States and on a train, I was working on the book. I had an idea of um, a woman walking a child across Krakow's main market square during the war. And as the story unfolded, I was on an Amtrak train from Washington to Philadelphia. And I met two very well-known Holocaust survivors, man and wife. And I don't generally name them because they've passed on. And I don't know if they would mind. But as I was on that train, the woman said to me, I told her about my book and she said, well, surely you know the story of the Krakow Jewish resistance movement. And I had just come back from two and a half years of living in Krakow. And I had never heard of a Jewish resistance there because everyone who was a part of it died during the war. And I went back to Poland and I was amazed to discover this rich history of resistance on the very streets where I had lived and worked. And that true history actually became the underpinning for my first novel, The Commandant's Girl. Now, the reason I had to tell you that is because what may not be known to most people here is that The Diplomat's Wife, which um, is the book we're here to talk about and which was just re-released, is my second novel. And it's actually, it was conceived of as a sequel. So The Diplomat's Wife takes a character from The Commandant's Girl a young woman who I didn't even know had survived the first book. And it tells her story after the war. So it starts with a point of inspiration. And this novel starts with Marta being freed from a Nazi prison. From that point, she could have gone on and lived a, a simple, quiet life, but she made a very different set of choices. What motivated her to make these choices? Well, it's so interesting. And I, I do want to tell you how Marta came to have a book of her own. So Marta was a lesser character in Commandant's Girl, not someone I gave much thought to. She wasn't entirely likable. But one day as I was trying to think of what I was going to write for the next book, I was in the bathroom brushing my teeth. And you know, all the good ideas happen in the morning. Sure. And I heard Marta pop up in my bathroom and say, it's my turn. And I thought, well, you know, I didn't even think you survived the first book, but lo and behold, she had. And I found her first in a Nazi prison and then in a displaced persons camp. And one of the things as a writer that's so interesting to me is you take a woman like Marta, who through normal history would have lived a very certain set of events in her life, but because of the war, she was just thrown off that path. She was tested and changed. She was part of the resistance. She was arrested. And now she finds herself with no past and with no one and quite a new beginning. And so the question becomes in those circumstances, what do you do? And in her case, um, there's no path back to Poland. There's no life there. The only way is forward. And so she goes and um, begins a new life in England. A new life and a new journey that has highs and lows with the affairs of the heart. How does love inform her choices? Well, it's interesting, you know, many of the characters in my book, I never set out to write romance. You know, the relationships are sort of very secondary or tertiary to me, but in, in my writing. 
but these are young women and, and, you know, these are just real parts of their lives. So at first, when she is in the displaced persons camp, she meets an American soldier. Um, and, you know, she's not looking to meet someone, my goodness, she's emaciated, she's sick, she's suffering, she's not, you know, not her best self, um, it, you know, in any sense of the word. Um, and she finds someone who really helps her heal a little bit. But, you know, fate is not fair. And for everything she's already been through, it would have been great if that was her happy ending, but it isn't. And she loses um, that first love, um, to the, if it is indeed her first love, but loses that love um, to really unfortunate circumstances. So again, she's knocked down and again, she stands up and she makes her life, her way to a new life in England, um, but only to find that the past has not really left her at all which seems relevant today. How would you say that some of the themes or events in the diplomat's life ring true today? And what do you think we can learn about reading historical fiction? Well, you know, it's it's very daunting. This is only maybe the second or third event I've done um, this year, you know, in January. And we're living through such stark and traumatic times right now. You know, you, you never saw sort of, expect yourself i mean we're going through some of the the most i don't know if you an epic i can't say you know i won't put too many adjectives on them because people view them differently but we're going through these events right now um with washington and with covid and, and and everything and there's a sense of inadequacy sort of a how dare i talk about fiction how dare i talk about novels and romance and these things while you know this is all going on in the world and the reason i mentioned this moment it's because it's very parallel to an emotion that I have felt many times while writing about the Holocaust. There's these moments of like, how dare you write about this? You know, who are you to tell this story um, that have happened to me again and again? Um, and the point that I come back to all the time and the point that I come back to now is that because these lessons of history are so very important and are more important right now than they ever have been. And so we must come back to them. Thank you. Marta's perspective in her marriage is, is truly heartbreaking. She has endured this torturous past and is now amid this slow burn of an unfulfilling marriage. Afterwards, she is expected to go to work and be subservient to her boss, which also happens to be her husband. That's quite a predicament for a protagonist who was once an activist. Where do you think she's coming from? Well, you know, it's interesting that, you know, with women in history, there's this very fine line you walk, right? Because we are telling stories of that are truly of female empowerment that are so timeless for this Me Too moment um, of women whose stories have been untold and their heroism has been unsung for so many years. But at the same time, they face some very real constraints in their lives, um, their livelihood, their well-being, you know, societally, they faced all of these constraints um, that you can't simply cast aside, right? So you take Marta, who in her own right has been a very strong woman, but is now living in a foreign country right, without really any sort of other support system, um, is dependent upon her husband in some sense for, for her sustenance and for, for everything that goes on around her and her family and her child and everything. She's in this sort of entrapped circumstance. Um, I'm not sure how a woman breaks free from that in the immediate post-war period. And I would couple that with saying she's a Holocaust survivor, right? So her decisions are going to be affected by that trauma she went through and the knowledge of exactly how bad things can be. Um, and maybe, you know, there, there's a little bit of, of gratitude at things just being okay um, that maybe makes her hesitant to push for more, at least in that moment. Pam, you write these women so beautifully. They're, they're complex, they're brave, they're flawed. They seek friendship and community. And at times, like Marta, trust the wrong person. What do you hope a reader sees in your heroines? 
Well, what any really in any of my characters, what I'm looking to explore is the gray areas. Um, so when I went to Poland, you know, I went there and I had a very certain view and an upbringing as to the history and the part of the world. And I found many of my state views very challenged when I was on the ground, kind of living among the people over there and just learning and interacting. And so I want my characters to be gray areas. I want um, you know, my heroes to be flawed and my, my villains to be human. And I want that full range of human behavior and the individualized choices that people made because I don't want to paint um, a people with broad brushstrokes. I want the nuance there in the characters. You want real people in your historical fiction. Correct. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a character or passage or element of one of your novels that's really special that stays with you? Well, you know, picking between your books or your characters, it's like picking between your kids and you just can't do that. So I have 10 books out. My 11th will be out in May. Um, and the one thing I will say is there is no correlation for me between the books that have been done well and the books that I like or I, that, I, that I'm proudest of. It's, so, it's sort of odd. You know, I, I'm very grateful to the ones that have done well and the ones that are better known in recent years. But there's also a couple of like, commercial stinkers that I really love, you know? So um, I, there's something in every book that challenged me or moved me. Um, one example I come back to a lot is I wrote a book called The Last Summer at Chelsea Beach, which was World War II on the home front. And that book is set in Philadelphia and Atlantic City during World War II. And my dad's family's from Atlantic City and my mom's family is from the part of Philadelphia where the book is set. And so it was an opportunity both to explore personal history, but also to learn of the home front aspects of the war that I hadn't known about at all. Pam, we call commercial stinkers hidden gems. So uh, we'll, we'll revisit those. All right, hidden gems it is. <laughs> and you referenced your new novel, the, the Woman with the Blue Star. What can you tell us? I said, The Woman with the Blue Star, I'm very excited about this book. It will be out May 4th. And this was inspired by true stories I found of people who survived World War II by hiding in the sewers and not just fleeing through the sewers, but going and living in the sewers for, for months at a time, if you can imagine such a thing. And in real life, there are many stories I wove into my fiction, but in real life, there was a young girl in the sewer and one day she looked up through the grate and she saw a girl her own age buying flowers on the street. And she was so struck by the disparity between their lives, you know, and her mother said to her, someday there will be flowers. And my book looks at fictionally a relationship between a girl who's in the sewer and a girl who is up on the street. So that is the woman with the blue star and that'll be out on May 4th. We can't wait to read it. Pam, I would love to continue this line of questioning, but I, I feel the need to share both the mic and the opportunity with other callers this evening. Allow me to turn this over to Mary Pat. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cecily. That's amazing. And Pam, how wonderful. I, I really feel like we got to know you and I can't wait to read the other eight books or I, I think <laughs> the other seven books that I haven't read. And I'll start with with the beach at Chelsea. Um, we have some great questions coming in from the audience. And just a reminder, if you haven't sent us your question yet, please feel free to type a question for Pam. This is a great opportunity to, to get the skinny from her um, in person, if you will. The, the first question, Pam, is how did your time at the State Department and the Pentagon inform your work? So this is a, a wonderful question. And rather than going on super long, which I always do, but it would eclipse other questions, I will say that, so the State Department piece was, was really those years in Poland that I've described and how they affected me. But what I don't often get to talk about is the year that I spent at the Pentagon. So when I was in college, this is complete trivia, but when I was in college, I went to GW and I had to pay for school myself. And I didn't have one of those lofty unpaid internships on Capitol Hill. I had a job for a law firm where I messengered packages around Washington in a taxi cab. And it was a great chance. I saw all sorts of history take place. But the managing partner from that law firm became the secretary of the army. 
And I read about this when I was living in Europe. And one day I picked up USA Today instead of the Herald Tribune. And it said that he had become secretary of the army. And I was studying at Cambridge. I was Euro railing at the time. And I wrote to my old boss and I said, I'd like to come work for you. And so I became the special assistant to the secretary of the army. It was a politically appointed position. And I spent the next year working with him. And it, it reminds me of the Sir Isaac Newton quote about seeing the world from the shoulders of giants, because clearly I was out of my league, right? I was in my early 20s and, you know, running around the, the top of the Pentagon. Um, but it was amazing that year. Um, we went, it was the 50th anniversary of World War II, and we went to all of the commemorations around the world. Um, and I, and that inspired one of my books, actually, The Winter Guest was inspired by one of the stories I learned there. So that's an example. Um, and we just, you know, I, I worked with the Pan Am Flight 103 families. We worked with the Oklahoma City bombing and just really life changing events. Um, and it was also probably one of the first times I had been to Eastern Europe was on one of those trips. And I felt this immediate connection with this, with the place and with that hmm. kind of region. So, yes. Wow. What chutzpah. I mean, <laughs> it was chutzpah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, mean, I need to talk to my children now and tell them to start looking for those sorts of opportunities. Yes. Um, Pam, the next question is, how was your most challenge, who was your most challenging character to write and why? So this could be any book, I suppose. And, and then maybe for this book as well, focus on the diplomat's wife. Goodness on the dip. Well, I will tell you, it was challenging coming to Marta because in the Commandant's Girl, Marta was awkward, unlikable. Um, she had a thing for the main character's husband, so that was a problem, right? And yeah. um, and so there there was a whole lot of struggle in was I really going to want to spend a year or two writing Marta? You know, that was a really big question. I will tell you the other great challenge about the Diplomat's Wife sequels are hard, right? So it's fun because I get to tell you what happens afterward, but you're stuck with all that history right. from book one. So if Marta has Coke bottle thick glasses in The Commandant's Girl, you better find her a pair of glasses in the DP camp or she's not going far, right? Wow. There, there's yeah, all yeah. this history you have. So I have very much a love-hate relationship with sequels. Um, Was this your only sequel, Pam, or has, has there been another sequel? No, I have, I'm trying to do the math, at least one more sequel. So I wrote an, a, a modern book. Where, um, um, Cecily would call it a hidden gem. I wrote a modern <laughs> book called Almost Home, and it had a sequel called A Hidden Affair. Okay. Yeah. Great. So I've done a couple sequels. Awesome. And I, I suppose we can get all of these books, even the hidden gems through Amazon. They're all there, but I, Amazon is great, and, and we've all relied on it heavily during the pandemic, but I highly urge, um, don't forget your independent booksellers. You guys, you all have what, Interabang? Am I saying yes, that wrong? we do, Dallas, and Interabang right? is our wonderful local, and, and well, there, there are several really good independent ones, but Interabang is great, and they've been a wonderful partner. And let me just say, I have a local indie Inkwood, which I adore, and they actually ship autographed for me. So if people oh. need autographed books, literally what they do is they say, we have some books for you to sign. And, you know, I drive over with my mask now and I sign them in the car. So very cool. So, so you've written, how long have you been writing, Pam? How many well, so I'll tell you, I had the 9-11 epiphany in 2001 mm -hmm. and my first book was accepted in 2005, um, published in 07. <laughs> so it's been a little bit of a while now. Yes. And, and 11, well, so the, the question was roughly how long does it take you to write a book? I mean, you're doing a book a year almost? Well, I'm going to tell you, back in the day when I started out, I was doing a book a year, you know, book a year, book a year. I've gotten older right? The <laughs> books have gotten harder. And I don't want to, you know, I'm not always dragging myself uh, to my office at four or five on Sunday morning. You know, it gets a little harder now. Um, and you so have children, right? I have three children, um, hopefully th th who are starting to sleep a little longer so I can work. But, um, you know, so I really prefer now a book every two years, 18 months to two years. And I prefer it both creatively to have mm -hmm. the time. I also prefer it commercially because it takes a lot to put out a book now. Um, it's my, yeah. you know, it's my whole village. And when we're traveling, it's the touring and on social media, everybody, you know, supports you. And I don't want to ask people to do that every year. I would much rather mm -hmm. slow down, 
pay it forward and have it be a bigger event when it happens. Sure. Have so you been with the same publisher and sort of a team that supports you for all of your books? I have not. I started okay. with, I started with this team that I am currently uh -huh. with back in 2005. Okay. And I went, I went to two other publishers in between, but I've been, I'm back with my original team. I have been for several years and it is, it's my dream team and it's a love fest and mm -hmm. I hope to never be anywhere else. Awesome. So, um, we have a question about the class you took. Um, if, you know, what sort of, you know, where did you, where would someone find this kind of class if they were interested? Are they, do you think they're widely available? And would you recommend doing that if, if you are an aspiring writer? I would. So I don't have a master's in fine arts or any particular qualifications as a novelist. But when I wanted to take this, um, Temple University in Philadelphia was offering a course called Write Your Novel This Year. They changed that to Write Your Novel This Month which I would never do, that's really scary. But um, but the, it was a simple nighttime course that you could largely pick up, frankly, at any sort of community college or something like that. There's also writer's workshop. So my course at the university spun off into a private writer's workshop that I did for many years. And you work in a small group, you share your work for critique. I don't get to go anymore because of my schedule, but that is wonderful. So any kind of class or workshop but I will also tell you, um, I love those simple books on writing craft. There's a shelf of them. If not at your local indie, there's definitely a shelf at Barnes and Noble. You can find them online. A shelf of how-to books about writing. I think those are also wonderful. So the single most important thing is just not to give up, really. Yeah. So, so um, here is a question from one of your new fans. It says, I can't wait to start reading your books. You are an impressive woman. Um, and the question is, did you keep working as a brand new attorney after 9-11 when you decided it was time to start writing a novel? So did, oh, did so you I go really ahead. want to tell that story, but I was yeah. trying not to go on too long with Cecily because I knew she had a lot of questions and I talk a lot. Um, <laughs> So when I had my 9-11 epiphany, which by the way, I very, I don't mean this with any disrespect, but I call the 9-11 epiphany, dear God, I don't want to die at the law firm. You know, I kind of really wanted to get to writing while I could. However, there was a catch. I was a new attorney at a very large law firm and I, and I love the law firm. I love the people, but I had a thousand dollars a month in student loan debt. I had a wow. so sure. I couldn't quit. I couldn't go right in a castle. Um, so what I did was I wrote my books from five to seven every morning before I went to the firm for all of those years. Um, and even now, I, I mean, I still have a, a job. I teach law school. I'm full time on the faculty at Rutgers. So I haven't given up the day job. I don't always get five to seven because of the kids, but I love five to seven. It's a good it's a good time frame. So, yes, I always had the day job. And I think it's worthwhile. You know, writing is ups and downs and writing is very solitary and it's nice to have that other life that um, is very symbiotic with the writing. Yeah. Are you one of those people that sleeps six hours a night or? Well, yes, I'm not oh. going to kid you. I would <laughs> like a lot. I would like a little more sleep. Like, honestly, I could use a little more sleep than I get these days, but I will tell you, it's not the writing and it's not the kids. It's the puppy right? It's the, <laughs> it's the pandemic puppy uh, that keeps you from sleeping. But yeah, I'd like to go to bed a little earlier, I think. If I, could. I have a grand puppy who's living oh. with me right now and, oh my and, and she's pretty cute, but, but a lot of energy. Oh. Um, so here's a question about the orphan's tale. Um, how did you go about researching circus life during the war? And did you have a prior interest in the circus? Did you discover anything interesting that, that didn't make it into the book? So I love, question. I love this question. Now for folks who are not familiar, The Orphan's Tale, um, which came out around 2017, was inspired by a true story of a German circus that hid Jews during the war and a young woman who hot becomes part of the circus to hide. So <clears throat> when I found this idea, at first I hesitated because I don't like the circus. I didn't <laughs> wanna go to the circus and I didn't wanna spend a year with the circus. Um, but the idea was so compelling that I had to. And the research was fascinating because first I had to learn about circus art 
And there's so much that goes into the planning of the circus, how they put the seats in the ring and the sequencing of the act. It's all very well thought out. Then my character was an aerialist. So I had to learn about flying trapeze a lot, um, <laughs> which was, and I had a, an aerialist helping me with this project. Um, one thing that was not a main part of that book, but was super interesting, as I was researching for the Orphan's Tale, I'm researching circuses, I walked across campus at Rutgers where I teach into this fabulous library. And I went to the World War II shelf and I pulled off a book that was called Jews in Popular German Entertainment, 1870 to 1950 or something like that. <laughs> This book had a whole chapter about Jewish circus dynasties. Can you imagine Jewish families that had 12 and 13 children, the Lorches and the Blumenfelds, and they ran these circuses that were all gone by the end of the war. So that was not my main story, but it was really fascinating as a piece of kind of background for one of the characters. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, what lessons do you think we can learn or that we need to learn um, today based on situations your characters faced historically? Well, you know, it's interesting. When I start a book, I never set out with like a theme or a message. It's never there. But somehow through the writing, the message kind of evolves. And I wonder if it's, it always sort of winds up being really timely. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but wonder if it's because of the times I'm living through while I'm writing the book. So sure. the Orphan's Tale came out four years ago, the week after the presidential inauguration. And it had all these themes of immigration and sanctuary and our personal responsibility to others, you know, that just mm. popped up to the fore. And then I wrote The Lost Girls of Paris, which came out two years ago. And that book is about women operatives who served the special okay. operations executive in Britain and were dropped behind enemy lines as, as saboteurs. And a theme that really came out in writing Lost Girls was the trust that we place in our government and whether such trust is warranted. So mm -hmm. it was kind of a moment. Um, and then now I've got the woman with the blue star. And you know, I wrote this book about people who were living in a sewer and then the pandemic hit. And I was writing the book uh, when we were all in total isolation uh, last wow. spring. And so um, I think that will resonate with people. But if I look more globally, we're talking about themes of individual responsibility and response, you know, and response to what is going right. on around us. Right. Well, that that's, you know, I think um being in Holocaust education, I'm constantly amazed at, you know, how many news stories we find, but also how relevant they are to our lives today. Yes. Um, you know, very, very timely. And some of the issues we're facing today with the polarization that we're experiencing in our community, I just, I think there are a lot of lessons that we can learn. Absolutely. Um, here's a, um, a question more about, about you and sort of what made you want to write. And, who were your favorite authors growing up or now? And do you have a particular genre that you especially enjoy reading? Do you even have time to read, Pam? <laughs> oh, many questions. So I was one of those little kids who always wanted to write. And so I was always writing and I was always reading, right? Um, so when I got into my teens, and interestingly, a lot of the historical fiction authors back then, there's a lot of women writing it now, but I feel like there were a lot of male authors at that time, right? So it was Leon yeah. Uris, John Jakes, Herman Wouk, Michener, all of those authors I read a lot of, but even before then, you know, I was a, a voracious reader. Um, and so, you know, Judy Bloom, it was a huge, huge inspiration for me. Um, so, uh, I, so I just read and wrote and read and wrote and, you know, all through the years and still, I still read a couple things about that. Um, I love libraries. Um, when it's not the pandemic, I use five library systems a week. 
um, wow. regularly personally. And so when I can, I'm going to walk in there. I'm sorry. It might be unhygienic, but I could kiss that floor when I get to go back <laughs> in the library, if not the librarian. Um, but so libraries are a very big thing, but then there's this wonderful internet, you know, online community, internet community with writing. And so I want to give a shout out in particular to a group on Facebook, Great Thoughts, Great Reads, which is a group of writers and readers where we all connect. And I get many of the ideas for things that I, you know, want to read lots of groups like that too many to name um and then in terms of what i'm reading everything but i'm too tired to think of it right now i read across genres i'm doing an initiative right now that's called 100 days of books where every day for 100 days i'm posting a book that i've loved i've done this twice before oh wow and so if anyone wants to follow along i do it across Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. I do it all, all across the platforms. And then at the end, it'll be like a hundred books that you might like to read. Awesome. Yeah. I'm just um, personally in awe, Pam, of how you teach law school full time and have three children and, you know, are writing a book every 18 months. It's, it's a May and you're reading and posting every day. It's incredible. But, um, but you know what? You haven't seen my, how bad my house looks is the thing right <laughs> you've got my fake living room back here yeah, uh, but if you, saw, if you it. saw my world i live <laughs> i live by the grace of my village you know really more like an army you know with my mom a mile down the road and um you know just all all of that you have a good support system i yeah. do i have the best awesome um so the next question is about um really your books that are more focused on the Holocaust, would you say that they're all standalone um, or is there one that you should read first that, you know, that the others build upon? Well, you know, so it depends how we say focused on the Holocaust, because what's really interesting is if you look across my books, none of them have gone into a concentration camp. Right. Um, my, so, so my books are about, and, and that's, I don't know if that's deliberate. It's, I'd have to think about that, but so most of my books are historical. Most of those are in the first half of the 20th century. And then the nucleus of those are during the Holocaust. So um, in terms of, I mean, the woman with the blue star coming out May 4th will be very much a Holocaust book. The orphan's tale is very much set during the Holocaust. Um, and the Commandant's Girl, which was the precursor to Diplomat's Wife is very much set during the Holocaust, but you don't have to read them in a particular order. And, and so this would sort of force you to, to tell us your favorite book, but for, for someone who's on the call tonight who just can't wait to read one of your novels who hasn't yet, what should they read first? Oh, that's a tough question. That's a tough question. So if you would like something that is more to the suspense espionage side of the war, you're going to go with the Lost Girls of Paris. If you yeah. want something that's a lighter, more nostalgic read, I would go with uh, The Last Summer at Chelsea Beach. And if you want kind of that hard hitting Holocaust book, maybe The Orphan's Tale. Fabulous. Um, I love the the girls of uh, the girls of Paris. Lost, yeah, girls, I read, of Paris, Lost yeah. girls of Paris. I read several years ago. I love that. Um, so there's often a relationship at the center of your stories. Was there something that you learned about relationships and love during wartime from your research? Were were people likely to to have to develop relationships more quickly? Well, I do think that's the case. You know, I don't set out to write relationships, but these are young, often young women and the relationships happen. I do think during war that timelines of relationships are intensified, you know, where you sort of don't know where you're going to be tomorrow. Um, classic example is the Lost Girls of Paris. Um, relationships sometimes form between the female agents and some of their male counterparts. And in um, in the book, it happens really quickly. And that was true to life when, when the agents deployed, they really had a life expectancy of just a few weeks. And so things tended to happen more intensely um, in a faithful manner. But I don't want to generalize. That's just yeah. anecdotal. Um, I have a question to ask you to repeat the name of your book, your bookstore that sends sign that will mail signed copies. Sure. It's called Inkwood Books. And it's, you can also write to me and I would tell you about Inkwood Books. It's in Haddonfield, New Jersey. Um, and you just call them and order what you want and say how you'd like the inscription personalized. And um, then they'll call me and I'll zoom by in my car and sign it for you and they'll mail it. <laughs> That's awesome. 
Wonderful. Um, okay, so two two more questions and, and then we'll wrap up. But one is about the, you know, specifically about the diplomat's wife and the the double agent or the secret agent. If, did you, is this based on, you know, someone in history that you, that you studied or you the husband? What? The, um, so let me say that, um, and I'll be general in case people haven't read it, but um, the, you know, the the book has a double age in it um this specific story is not based on an actual person or an actual betrayal but i've always been fascinated there's this story and i'm going to get it wrong off the cuff but there was a bunch of agents who were working for the soviets um for at cambridge right kim philby and the cambridge six right so uh -huh. um which I, I went to Cambridge. So I was always fascinated by that story. Um, so there's some notion of those kinds of people who really, you know, permeated the British government um, mm -hmm. and were double agents, but, um, but it wasn't geared toward any one person in this case. Okay. Um, and last question, um, what advice would you give to an aspiring writer? Um, I, I have three pieces of advice that I give in collect collectively to inspiring writers. And the first is that you must be very guarded with your time because even after all these years, no one, not my most supportive husband or my beloved mom says, oh honey, why don't you go take some writing time? Like you still have to find the time. I don't think anyone appreciates the quantum of hours that go into a book and where you have to find that time. So you must guard that time. The second piece of advice would be to be really ten tenacious and persistent because I didn't tell you this, but when I started out, my book was rejected 39 times, you know, and over, you know, it took five years. It took 39 attempts before someone accepted that first book. Um, and the only thing that separates me from the other folks in that writing workshop that I started in is that I just kept trying. I was no more talented than them. I just kept banging at that door until it opened. And so you have to keep going. The mm -hmm. last piece of advice is that you must develop the ability to revise your work. Um, I get this from having been a lawyer, right? Where people mark up your briefs and everything, the senior people. Um, right. You have to take feedback from others, constructive slash negative feedback, and you have to make it your own and incorporate it in your own voice because they don't give you solutions. They give you problems to fix. And so mm -hmm. I really believe that the ability to take all of that feedback and revise is what's going to make it over that final hurdle. Great advice. And, and I think that's great advice for a lot of careers too, yes. to take constructive feedback and, and to use it to make your work better. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, it has been such a delight to visit with you. I mean, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Um, I wish you incredible success on the release of The Woman with the Blue Star. And that's coming out in May, correct? May 4th. And I hope that when this is all over, we can all visit in person. I'm going to hop a plane. I may or may not wear my Eagles jersey to Dallas, but I will hop a plane and do this in person, I hope. Awesome. Well, I think, um, you know, we would love when we can have programs in, in person, we would love for you to come. And, and I bet you're going to be writing several books in the future that will be very relevant for us. So we Absolutely. look forward to inviting you to Dallas. Thank you. And um, Cecily, I want to thank you again for moderating this evening's program and leading such a wonderful discussion and to Northern Trust for making this possible. And before um, I close tonight, I'd like to invite you to join us on Tuesday, next Tuesday, January 19th at 6 p.m., for an event that we are hosting with Mayor Eric Johnson. It's, um, it was on the slideshow before we started and, and you can get information about it on our website. It's called Looking Back at 2020, Racism, Anti-Semitism and Public Safety Challenges in Dallas. And we're so delighted to be partnering with Mayor Johnson. And then also please consider joining us on Sunday, January 24th at 2 p.m. for the museum's international Holocaust Remembrance Program. It, it's a lovely program and it's very meaningful every year. So we'd love for you to be a part of that. So please visit our website at dhhrm.org to learn more and to view our incredible 2021 program lineup. 
thank you all for joining us tonight. Good night, Pam. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.